remain standing now as we read God's law or God's word as I read two portions of scripture, Exodus 24 for our Old Testament portion and then Revelation chapter 4. And I will say that it was quite difficult choosing our Old Testament portion this evening because there are so many portions of scripture that are that are parallel passages and and that and that speak into this passage that we're going to be looking at tonight but I chose this one for for better or for worse I chose this one because of what it says about our God and how it points us to him in even in the old testament in this way Exodus 24 verses 9 to 18 Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. It was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel he did not lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate and drank. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there. And I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments which I have written that you may teach them. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man has a difficulty, let him go to them. Then Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Turn now to Revelation chapter 4. As we, unlike Israel, are now invited up to enter into the very throne room of God. Revelation chapter 4. John the Apostle. After these things I looked... And behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist 
and were created. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Please be seated as we pray. O oh, gracious God and Father, how humbling it is for us to know that we have been given in our Savior Jesus Christ a privilege that your people Israel in the Old Testament did not have. A privilege to be invited, as it were, into your very throne room because our Savior Jesus Christ is there and because we are in him. To be invited to see things which Israel of old was not permitted to see to be invited into your very presence, that we might understand who it is that we worship, why it is that we worship him, and what you, through your son Jesus Christ, are doing in the world. Lord, these are monumental things. These are things that we cannot understand or comprehend by human reason but how we thank you that you have revealed them to us in your word, in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. And we thank you for the way that you bring those scriptures together, for the way that you teach us from those things that are both old and new, that we might understand who our Savior is, and understanding who he is and all that he has done for us, that we might serve him, that we might glorify him, that we might worship him, in spirit and in truth. And so we pray that you would help us to do so not only this evening, but that, we, that you would use those things that we read and hear this evening to lift us up to heaven, as it were, that we might understand what it is that we have in Christ and live in a manner that is glorifying to him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have a question for you. Tonight, I often like to start a sermon with a question, something of a provocative question. I like to do that sometimes, too. Are we living in the last days? What would you say if someone asked you, are we living in the last days with all of the things that are happening in the world around us? Are we living in the last days? Well, I would submit to you that you don't need a newspaper or the internet or a television set to know that we're living in the last days. You only need the scriptures to know that we are living indeed in the last days. Consider, for instance, Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when Peter, in his great Pentecost sermon, quoting from the prophet Joel, says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. The day, the last days had begun and, and God poured out his spirit. But if that's not enough, let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now the spirit expressly says in verse 1, that in latter times, same expression really, the last days, in latter times some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And then in 1 Peter chapter 1, we read something very similar. 1 Peter, if I can find it. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, speaking of Jesus, but was manifest in these last times for you. Hebrews chapter 1. We're, seeing, we're starting to see a pattern, I hope. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. I could go on, 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, and many other scriptures. And the answer to the question is yes, we are living in the last days. We have been living in the last days since 
the days of Jesus, since the resurrection. This is the last time. This is the time that was prophesied by the Old Testament prophets. We have entered into the kingdom. The glory of the kingdom is already being revealed, the kingdom that was promised in the Old Testament. We have already entered in by Jesus. Jesus already has dominion. We've already been seeing this as we've been going through the book of Revelation. Jesus is a king, but he's also a prophet and a priest. We have entered in. We are in the last days. And the book of Revelation was given to teach us how to live in this world in these last days by faith and not by sight. That's why we have this book. The only way to do that is to have a heavenly perspective. Do you remember Psalm 78? You may may be familiar with that psalm. And the psalmist is, is lamenting many, many things. And then as he goes through all of the things that he's lamenting, finally he says, well, it was when I entered the sanctuary the temple of God, that's when I understood what was really happening. And the only way that you're ever going to understand what God is doing through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, by the Spirit right now in history is if you enter into the heavenly sanctuary. And that's what we've been invited to do here in this chapter. Because here in this chapter, God, by means of His written Word, is inviting us, His people, His children, His blood-bought saints. He's inviting us into His heavenly dwelling place so that we can see things as they really are. You see, we, as we've been looking at the seven letters to the churches, we've been, we've been seeing how things are. We saw that the church is a glorious mess. It's Jesus' glorious mess. We've, we've seen that, that earthly perspective. We've seen how things are in the world below in this age in which we live. We haven't yet seen the heavenly perspective of God himself, and that's what we're invited to do as we consider this passage this evening. So I want to look at two things this evening. First, God's heavenly throne. And second, God's heavenly worship. God's heavenly throne, God's heavenly worship as we consider this portion of God's Word, this precious portion of God's Word that, as I told uh, my wife, May, as I was getting ready to come here this evening, I said, I don't know how you preach a passage like this. I really don't. I don't know how you even begin to unfold the riches and the glory that are here, but my hope is that we will come away seeing something of our Savior Jesus Christ tonight. And so we want to see God's heavenly throne. That's the first thing that's presented to us here. And this is a vision. This is John's vision of of heaven. John is being invited by God into the very presence of God, something like the way that Moses was invited up to see God and, and it's something like that, but, but unlike that as well, because the fact is, is that something great has happened since the days of Moses. If the, if the glory revealed to Moses was great, how much more the glory that is revealed to us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what John, John's whole task, his whole mission is to reveal Jesus Christ to the people of Christ, because the book is the book of the Revelation of Jesus, the unveiling, the unfolding, the apocalypse, the the uncovering of the one who has up to this point been hidden. And now we're we're going to see the glory of Jesus, his heavenly glory, not the glory that he had in his humiliation. That was glory. But now we're going to see the glory that he has right now in his exaltation. I've been going through the shorter catechism with my children and the question that we're in Right now, I've been asking them, what does it mean? What does it mean that that Jesus came in his state of humiliation? And they'll tell me, well, it means that he was made low. Well, what does it mean that he's in his state of exaltation? Well, it means that he's been made high. He's higher than all the kings of the earth. He is Lord of lords, king of kings. He is glorious in majesty, in excellency. And and he's always been the second person of the Trinity, but now he is manifested as the glorious one in history. And so he's exalted. When I asked my children, I said, well, 
Which of those estates is Jesus in right now? Is he in his estate of humiliation? Or is he, he, is he in his estate of exaltation? They'll say he's in his estate of exaltation. And we'll all say, thank the Lord that he is. And so the vision takes place after these things. We read there in our text, after these things. And, and that has been variously interpreted by, by many people. I think some have interpreted it more helpfully than others, as we've seen in, in various at various points in our, uh, in our uh, looking at the book of Revelation. I think what it means is that after the vision that John has of the Son of Man and the seven churches, now a new vision begins. A new vision. And there's cycle after cycle of, of visions. There are actually seven cycles of visions in the book of Revelation. Well, here's a new vision. And so John says, after these things, after the vision that I had of the Son of Man, the glorious Son of Man, the one who had eyes like flames of fire, the one had, who had a sword coming out of his mouth, the one who walked in the midst of the, the candlesticks, or the midst of the lampstands, after that vision, I had, amazingly, another vision. I had a vision of, of what things were like in the world, on earth, the seven churches in Asia, and now... I have an even more glorious vision. The vision brings us, it brought John, into the heavenly throne room of God. And what does it do? It sets forth Christ as the exalted ruler of the church and of all creation. Now, you don't see that so clearly here in chapter 4. But chapter 4 and chapter 5 go together. I, just, I didn't want to preach them together because I thought it would be too much. But I want you to understand as we go through that these two chapters are inseparable. You've got to put them together. If you don't put them together, you're, you're going to miss much. Because we're going to see in chapter 5 that, that Jesus, the Lamb who was slain, is seated upon the throne. The one who is seated upon the throne is found to be the only one in heaven and on earth who is worthy to open the scrolls. And what are the scrolls? The scrolls are God's decree for history. And Jesus is, is graciously going to unfold. He's, gonna, he's going to reveal not only himself as the one who's going to cause these things to come to pass, but he's going to reveal in in. In outline form, he's going to reveal all of history from the resurrection to the end of time. He's going to unfold that for you and for me so that we can have an understanding that he is Lord of Lords, King of Kings, that he's reigning over all history, that every event that happens in this world, in our lives as well, that everything that happens is completely under his control because he's on the throne. That's what we're going to see. That's glorious. And we've been invited into that glory. And so in the full context of chapters 4 and 5, we're going to see that this is really the whole purpose of the book, to set forth Jesus as the Son of Man who is reigning over all things. That Jesus, by his death and by his resurrection, has become, it's an accomplished fact, Lord of all. And if you understand that, then you will be able to say, no matter in what tribulation you find yourself in, you will be able to say, Jesus is Lord of all, even this. That's what this book does for us. It's the entire basis of our comfort in this life. And he is also our comfort for the life to come. And so John sees a door open. He hears a trumpet. The door is simply the door of the heavenly temple. When you, when you look at the idea of the door in Scripture, Jesus actually calls himself the door, doesn't he? But the door is the idea of, of the entrance into the temple. The only way into the temple is through the door. And who is the door? Jesus is the door. We're being invited in. We're being invited into the heavenly temple, which is the pattern for the temple below the temple of the Old Testament, and now the temple that's being built up, a dwelling place of God in the Spirit, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That temple up there is the pattern for the temple below. That's why we started out looking at the seven churches, but now we're seeing the pattern. We're seeing the archetype. We're seeing the heavenly temple. The same language that's, that's used here 
is also used in chapter 11 and chapter 15 of, uh, in connection with the idea of a heavenly temple. And there too, in those chapters, 11 and 15, you, you find that, that connected with that are flashes of lightning and thunder, just like you saw at Sinai in the Old Testament. This is a place of great power and glory and wonder, a place where we are called to take off our shoes, as it were, where the very cherubim that Isaiah saw in chapter 6 of, uh, of the book of Isaiah where the angels themselves, the cherubim themselves, would, would fly with six wings and they would cover their eyes and they would cover their feet because they, they couldn't bear the very glory of the God in whose presence they worshipped because that glory was too great for any created being. And John hears a voice. The voice sounds like a trumpet. It's the very same thing that we read back in Revelation chapter 1. He says it's the first voice. He hears the first voice. What voice is he speaking of? He's speaking of the voice of the risen Christ, the voice of the Son of Man. That's the first voice. That's the voice he's already heard, the same voice that sounded even then as, as, uh, as like a trumpet. And that voice tells him, come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Now, sometimes this um, section or this statement has been taken as a, as a way of, of symbolically representing what's regarded as the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And so you, you have this, this statement here, come up here and I will show you things which must take place, uh, which must shortly take place after this, or which must take place after this. And the idea is, they'll say, the idea is that this is symbolically represents the taking up of the church before the tribulation. Well, there's a whole theology called dispensationalism that, that you're not going to hear preached from, from this pulpit that, that, uh, that, take, that uses that. But the, 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 the main thing you need to understand about that is that those who teach that usually will say that you need to take everything literally unless you have some reason to take it symbolically. Well, uh, this is a vision. John's already said that it's, it's a vision. And so this, this, is, this is not something that has to do with the church being caught up. This is John being called up into heaven that he might reveal the things or that he, he might be used by God as an instrument of revelation that we might understand something about Christ our Lord who is right now in heavenly glory. And so these things must come to pass. There's a decree of God. There's a divine must. If you'll look with me there. In uh, verse 1, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. These things must happen. There's, there's a decree of God. The church must suffer. We're going to see much suffering, much suffering of the church in the rest of the book of Revelation. But Christ must prevail. If you take away anything from this sermon or from this series of sermons, that would be the thing to take away. The church must suffer and Christ must prevail. And that should fill your heart with not anxiety, not fear, but with hope and courage because Christ is the one who has overcome for us. The things which must come to pass are those things that will flow out of the revelation of the Lamb in chapter 5. And so in chapter 6, you're going you're to see that opening of the seals. Jesus or the, the Lamb on the throne is going to begin to unseal the seals. Daniel was told to seal these things up until the time of the end. Now, the things that were sealed are going to be unsealed. And as, chapters after, as chapter after chapter begins to unfold, we're going to see this revelation of Jesus and of all that Jesus has under his control. And we're going to see that, yes, the church must suffer, but yes, Christ must prevail. All of the things that are revealed are flowing out of the revelation of the Lamb. We'll see that in chapter 5. And so John's vision is a vision of glory, of heavenly glory, of the heavenly temple. 
It's a vision of God's glory. So what does John see when he's brought into the heavenly temple? Well, as I said, it's a vision. He's in the spirit. We've already seen in the book of Revelation how this is a book of symbols, a book of images, a book of pictures. Many of those pictures are from the Old Testament. We've, we've seen that this is a picture book that comes out of the soil of the Old Testament so that if you understand and, and know the symbolism of the Old Testament, then you will have something of an understanding of what's going on here in the book of Revelation. You have to understand the whole Bible in order to understand this book. You're not, you're not seeking to interpret the book of Revelation with, with a newspaper in, in, in one hand and, and your Bible in the other. That's not how you deal with the book of Revelation. You, in order to understand the book of Revelation, you have the Old Testament in one hand and you have the New Testament in the other and you see that God has brought them together in Christ. And so that's how you understand what's going on here. He's, he's in a vision. He's in the Spirit this is similar language to what we find in Daniel chapter 7 and Ezekiel chapter 1. John sees one seated on the throne. Daniel chapter 7, he sees the ancient of days. Daniel 7 is really the background. In fact, I wanted to read Daniel 7 until I thought about reading Ezekiel chapter 24. Uh, I should say Exodus chapter 24. I wanted to read Daniel 7 because Daniel 7 is really the background. If you understand Daniel 7, you're going to understand something of what's going on here. What's going on here is that John is seeing one on the throne called the Ancient of Days by Daniel. He's seeing the God of creation, but he's not just seeing the Father here. He's seeing the triune and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit on the throne. He's seeing the God of Israel. He sees a throne. He sees God's place of rule over all creation. He's seeing a throne that is the very center of the universe. The throne that's the very heart of your assurance and my assurance. The Puritans speak so often of contentment. I was listening to something about the Puritans this week, and it had just so happened that Jeremiah Burroughs was mentioned in what I was listening to, and I thought that was interesting because our ladies' group is studying Jeremiah Burroughs and, and his book on contentment. But you know what was said in that, in that uh, radio interview that I was listening to? What was said was that the reason that the Puritans could find contentment in this world is because they understood the sovereignty of the God that they worshipped. And that comforted their hearts. That's why they could have contentment in a world like the world that we lived in, like the world that we live in. What we see here is a description of the glory of God, which really can't be described. There's no way to describe the glory of God. So we have these images. It doesn't, it doesn't tell us everything that there is to know about the glory of God, but it tells us some things, and we need to pay attention to what we're being told. There's, there's a vision of precious stones. We've seen that before in Scripture. We've seen that in the Garden of Eden, for example. Precious stones there in that first sanctuary of God, that first place of man dwelling together with God. We've seen precious stones on the breastplate of the high priest in the Old Testament with the names of the tribes engraven on those stones. And then we'll see it again later in the book of Revelation. The foundation stones of the city, the eternal city, the new Jerusalem. What are they? They're precious stones. We see also a rainbow around the throne. And in God's providence, we've been, pre we've been uh, working our way through the book of Genesis, and we've just been through the covenant that God made with Noah. And we saw that, that God gave the sign of the rainbow as a sign of his faithfulness, as a sign of his promise to never again destroy the world with a flood a sign of his mercy that he's going to continue to work in this world. He's going to continue his plan of salvation all the way to the end. He's not going to destroy humanity because he has a plan for humanity. He has a plan in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the rainbow is a reminder that God is going to do all that God has said. 
And every time, as, I, as I've said so often, every time you look at the rainbow, you can know that God is faithful. You can know that God will never let his word fall to the ground. Well, God is faithful, and that's what we see. The God who is revealed in heaven above is a God who is faithful to his covenant. The final vision of the book of Revelation is, a con is the consummation of all that the rainbow reveals to us. All that God has revealed to us in the sign of the rainbow is consummated in those final chapters of the book of Revelation. When, when there's no more sea, there's no more stormy water, when every tear has been wiped away, when, every, uh, when all sickness and death are gone, the final vision is a consummation of all that God has promised his people in the rainbow, that God will be their God, even to the very end of the age. John sees one more thing in connection with the throne. He sees around the main throne 24 more thrones. We see that in verse 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. So seated on the throne are 24 elders. They have white robes, a symbol in the book of Revelation of those who have been cleansed by the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ. They have, they have golden crowns on their heads, the signs of those who are both kings and priests together with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see, you have a picture here of redeemed humanity worshiping the Lord Jesus. There's an Old Testament significance to, these, to this number 24. In the Old Testament, the orders of priests, there were 24 orders of priests. There were 24 gatekeepers around the temple. There were 24 worship leaders. You can find all of that in 1 Chronicles. And, and connected with all of this, or, or uh, this is connecting us with the redemption of all nations, Revelation chapter 7, the, the redeemed of all nations are those who are washed in the blood of, lamb, of the Lamb. They're wearing white robes. They've, they've, they've come out of the great tribulation, and they are the redeemed of all nations, of all humanity. And so you see, you see these elders again. Uh, you, you, you see the, these redeemed again in Revelation 21, 12 to 14, where you find 12 patriarchs, 12 Old Testament patriarchs and 12 apostles of the Lamb. And you put those together, and what you have is you have the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints represented by the Old Testament patriarchs and the 12 apostles. You put them together, and you have the whole church, all of the redeemed, represented before the throne of God. The picture is of the whole church represented by the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles, the whole redeemed humanity, worshiping as the universal royal priesthood of all mankind, purchased by the blood of Christ. And you see, when we come into our worship, when we come into worship on the Lord's day, we have entered the heavenly places. It doesn't look like it. We're in a hotel room. It doesn't appear that way, but we've entered by faith and not by sight. And so you see, if you, if you want to see one thing and one thing only, it needs to be this, that if you are in Christ, you are right now seated with him in the heavenly places. If you are in Christ, you are participating by faith in the worship of heaven. You are part of the royal priesthood purchased by Christ. You may be a part of the church here on earth, which is, as I've said, a glorious mess. But the reality is you are not of this world. This world is not your home. You are victorious in Christ. You are seated with him already on his heavenly throne. And that is the source of all your encouragement as you suffer for his name. What's most significant is that God's glory cannot be separated from Christ. And Christ cannot be separated from his body, the church. Our worship on the Lord's Day brings us into that heavenly reality and reminds us of who we are and where we truly dwell and comforts us in our heavenly hope. And so if we don't understand that worship is important already, we come to a chapter like this 
we ought to bow down before the throne and worship the one who has given us his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, secondly, God's heavenly worship. We've seen his throne now. Let's look briefly at his worship. First thing that we want to see is that all creation is represented before God's throne. Look with me at verse 5. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. It all points us again, as I said, back to Sinai. The phrase, the, the phrase thunderings and, and lightnings is always connected in the book of Revelation to God's judgments. God's judgments are coming. They're going to be revealed. The seals are going to be opened. And, and there's going to be frightful judgments that are going to come upon the earth. God's judgments are certain, and they emanate from his holy throne. We need to see that. The judgments that we're going to see in later chapters of the book of Revelation emanate from the holy throne. And they come only as Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the one who was slain for the sins of the world, begins to open those seals. God's judgments are certain, but they're not meant to frighten God's people. God's judgments are not meant to frighten God's people. Rather, they are meant to comfort and to strengthen and to encourage us to wait on the final judgment in patience. In patience to keep our souls. This is the patience of the saints. That they would see what's coming upon the earth, particularly as God reveals those things in outline form here in the book of Revelation. And that they would not be frightened by what's coming upon the earth, but rather that they would look up that we would look up and that we would rejoice because the day of our redemption is drawing near as we see the signs of his coming. Again and again and again in the book of Revelation, you have this exodus imagery. Think of the plagues. The plagues, ten of them, just like the plagues against Pharaoh and against Egypt. The message of the book of Revelation is simply this. As I have delivered my people in the past, just as I delivered them through the Red Sea, just as I delivered them out of the hand of Pharaoh, as I have delivered my people in the past, so I will do for my people now in Jesus Christ. That's the message of the book. Is that the way that you think when you see God's judgments in history? We've seen just the, the smallest outskirts of the power of God in history in recent months. Just the tiniest outskirts of his power, even as, as the nations have been shaken in ways that we are even just now beginning to understand. Well, do you think of this? Are you fearful of the thunder, or are you able to see behind it the one who is seated on the throne? Seven lamps of fire, verse 5. Again, temple imagery. We've, we've seen it already. The candlesticks, the lampstands, the lamps in the temple signified the presence of God, the light and the glory of God. Seven spirits are the spirit of God in his fullness as the spirit of the risen Jesus. That's so why in the New Testament he's, he's revealed as the sevenfold spirit. You see it even back in Zechariah chapter 4. He's revealed as the sevenfold spirit because he is now the spirit of the risen Jesus. He's not like he was in the Old Testament. He hasn't changed. But what has changed is that Jesus has come, Jesus is risen, Jesus is reigning, and the spirit in that sense is being poured out upon the nations. There's a sea of glass like crystal in verse 6. In the Old Testament, there was a bronze basin for cleansing. As the priests would go into the tabernacle or later the temple, there was this bronze basin that was called the sea. And it was a place where the priests would, would clean their hands as they were preparing. As they were offering sacrifices, they would clean their hands, which were so bloody after offering those sacrifices. There also may be a connection here to the Red Sea, as I mentioned a moment ago. It was there with the waters raging and threatening to destroy that God delivered his people. And later in the book of Revelation, we're going we're to find 
that there's a, there's a song that's being sung. It's the song of Moses, the song of Moses at the Red Sea after the, the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. And then there's another song, the song of the Lamb. Those two songs are coming together in this wonderful book. And you see here in this vision, the sea is calm. The sea is still. God is in control. The one who created heaven, earth, and sea. The one who rules the wind, who rules the waves, who is able to walk even on the wind in the waves in the person of Jesus Christ. He is able to still and to calm all that might threaten or harm the people of God. And you see in Revelation 20, 22, there's a river of life that flows from where? From the throne of God, clear as crystal. Verse 6 again, in the midst of the throne, there are these four living creatures. And this is almost a, a bizarre vision. It's so hard for us to even wrap our minds around these, these four living creatures. Well, again, this is symbolic language. This is imagery, and it's imagery from the Old Testament. We need to keep that in mind. These, these creatures are allusions to Ezekiel's visions of thrones and creatures. And, and all of creation is actually represented in these four classes uh, of creatures. As you, as you look at them, you've got a, a lion representing the wild beast. You've got a calf representing the domesticated animals. You've got a, a creature that looks like a man. And you've got another flying creature. All of the creatures at least those creatures uh, upon the earth or that fly above the earth are represented here. And, and it's a representation of all creation. These living creatures symbolically represent all creation before God, all creation doing what it is created to do, to glorify the God of heaven. That's what creation does here in the heavenly temple. All creation glorifies God. What is it that the living creatures are doing? They're ascribing worship and glory to God, verse 8. It's a picture of what worship is and what it ought to be and what it will be for all eternity. God is holy, 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 the thrice holy God described in Isaiah chapter 6. And if you know how the Hebrew language works, when those three words are put together like that, holy, holy, holy. The idea is that God is superlatively holy. There is nothing and no one holy like God. God is holy. All of the perfections of his nature are shining forth. And that, that, that glory that comes forth from God is his holiness. He is the almighty God. He is all powerful. He is all glorious in all his perfections. He is eternally and eternally. He is eternal and eternally, omnipotently, transcendently holy. That's the God that you and I worship. Notice what the 24 elders do when the whole creation gives glory to God. This is, this is actually pretty startling and amazing. They give a different kind of glory to God. You see, they do what only the redeemed can do. No angel in heaven can glorify God the way that you and I are able to glorify God in our worship on the Lord's day. They give a different kind of glory to God. They fall down before the triune God, the God of our salvation, and the ones who have been made kings and priests in Jesus Christ, they lift the crowns that were given to them by God, the crowns that are theirs by sovereign grace alone, and they cast those crowns at the foot of the throne. Verse 11. They give glory to God as the redeemed of the Lamb, as the blood-bought redeemed of Jesus Christ. They give a kind of glory that the angels in heaven can only look into and rejoice at. And the response of the elders is actually exactly the same as Nebuchadnezzar back in Daniel chapter 4. Again, read Daniel if you want to understand the book of Revelation better. The, the response is exactly the same. It gives glory to the God of heaven, the one who created all things. 
These elders, they worship not only because they are creatures. They worship not only because God is the creator. They worship because God has demonstrated his glory in the glory and power and kingdom, the present kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the one who reigns, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And because their worship is the worship not only of creatures, but of blood-bought children. This is the worship that you and I have been brought into this evening. We don't see what's happening with our natural eyes. We see it only by faith, but we are in, right now, we are in the heavenly throne room. That's why the call to worship is so important. That's why when God calls us into his worship, it's not, a, it's not just a must come. It's a delight to come and to be in the very presence of God. We are worshiping the triune and living God through his son, Jesus Christ. And we are already participating in and partaking of the worship of the age to come. We're in the last days. When the powers of the age to come have already begun to break in, and they're breaking right into our hearts as we worship the triune God. We know we're not worthy of this, but we cast our crowns at the foot of the throne where there is one who is worthy, one who has prevailed, one who lives and was dead and is alive forevermore. And so are we living in the last days? Well, we're living in the age of the Spirit, the age of the kingdom and power and glory of Jesus Christ. We alone in this world are able to see it and experience it and give God the glory that is due to his name together with all the saints who have ever lived, all the angels and all creation. And to see this is to see heaven opened up, as it were, the throne of God revealed, and on that throne to see the risen, reigning Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is being revealed in this book of Revelation. It's precisely what we need to see. It's precisely what you and I need to see. Do you know what happens if you see these things by faith? You begin to live in a quiet confidence and contentment that the world cannot shake. You experience a comfort that the world cannot understand or comprehend. And you rest in an assurance that the world cannot possibly know except by the grace of God as he opens another heart and another heart and another heart to receive the things that were spoken long ago in the scriptures. This is what it means to have a heavenly perspective, to have heaven as your home, even as you live below for a time in this world, even as you live in the midst of a church that's a glorious mess. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God and Father, we thank you for this glimpse that we've received tonight of the heavenly throne room. And how we thank you, O oh Lord, that we can know by faith that we have been brought into that throne room, and that we are seated with our Savior Jesus Christ in heavenly places because we are united to him by the Spirit. How we thank you, O oh Lord, that you've given this book and the truths that are set forth for us in this portion of your word. You've given it to us that we might live in these last days in courage, in comfort, in assurance, and in hope. We pray that you would strengthen our hearts to do so. In Jesus' name, amen.